بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We always commence by praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى because he is the one who gave us this life that we are living and he is the creator of absolutely everything and he is the one who is in absolute control of every aspect of our existence and we always send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the goodness that we are in, he was the one chosen to actually deliver it to us. And his companions, his household, they were chosen to be with him and they were chosen uh, to sacrifice right at the beginning. We ask Allah to bless them all and to bless every single one of us. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, as I walked into this masjid, I need to tell you a few things. We are here for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I love you for the sake of Allah. Perhaps we don't know each other except maybe online. And some of the faces look like they are quite heavy tweeters here, mashallah. So we notice some of the faces and I say, I think I know this face from Twitter, subhanallah. Before I came in the vehicle, I was noticing some of the tweets of the brothers and sisters connected to this particular event and I saw pictures of some of the brothers who were seated here from Salatul Asr. Do you know that? So I felt so embarrassed and when I walked in, subhanallah, I noticed that the heat was intense and immense. And I was telling myself I'm going to cut this program short because I don't know how I will be sweating and speaking and I brought very few tissues here and I was about to ask the brothers to say, please, can I have a box of tissues? But guess what happened? When we were reading Salah, the masjid was packed, mashallah. And the heat was intense, and I felt the sweat trickling down my back. And I thought to myself, subhanallah, we are here for who? For Allah. And wallahi, as I sat on this chair, I smiled because I felt how cool it was, mashallah. A fan in the back, fan in the front, that can only happen in Singapore, mashallah. And I see the, the sisters as well, mashallah, enthusiastically sitting here. Tonight's talk is on love. That's why I say I love you all, my brothers and sisters, for the sake of Allah. And we may never get to know each other personally because it's impossible for me to sit and shake hands with so many people. But inshallah, consider it a feeling from the heart. If I was able, I would. And if I meet you sometime coincidentally, somewhere perhaps in a public place like a mall or maybe an airport or somewhere, don't be embarrassed or shy to greet. And I won't be either. I will greet you and I will smile at you. Whether you know me or not, that doesn't mean much. But let's learn to greet each other. There is a major problem amongst the people of the Ummah. We see our brothers and sisters and we walk past them without even smiling because we don't know them. And that's a prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ, where he says there will come a time when salam will only be for ma'rifah, if you know the person or if you want something from them. You know them or they are somebody distinguished, so you greet them. Salamu alaikum. Brother, the day you sell your Mercedes Benz, they won't be interested in greeting you. May Allah grant us all iPhone 7s, alhamdulillah. So, my brothers and sisters, we should not be only greeting those we know. No, at least acknowledge the people you don't know as well. Assalamu alaikum as you walk past. It's nothing haram. You are greeting the person, you are acknowledging. In fact, we should be acknowledging even the kuffar around us, perhaps not with the Islamic greeting, because they perhaps would know good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and hi, and good night better then they would know the Islamic greeting and some of them may be insulted by it and it's an Islamic injunction to be careful of this but at the same time acknowledge, greet. 
When we are Muslims, imagine I was in the lift a few minutes ago, not too long ago, maybe a half an hour ago. I was in the lift where I'm staying and there were some people who were in the lift. I don't know who they were, where they were from, but I greeted them. And I said, good evening, as I walked in and they looked at me. Mm. Yes, and they acknowledged. And a little while later, as they were leaving the lift on another floor, you know, we had chatted. They, they were asking me where you're from and I was asking them where they were from and so on. And I said, you have a nice day. Now my wife was with me and she says, hey, it's not day, it's night. I said, I didn't say have a nice day. I said, have a nice stay. And I speak with Tajweed, so I hope you understand. <laughs> and honestly, if you don't understand what I say, please send me an email because it means I need to correct myself. And I love to be corrected. I am one of those who loves to speak simple language. I want everyone to understand. And I open my mouth and I speak quite clearly with Tajweed. And I'm sure you know that. It's a fact, isn't it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. This is why when I entered, the brothers will, will confirm. I asked, how's the sound? Is it loud? Because I want people to hear me. I don't want to scream and yell. Hey, can you hear what I'm saying? No, let this microphone carry it. We love each other for the sake of Allah. And we need to be able to speak to each other in a beautiful way. When I look at you, when you look at me, we need to feel the bond of the shahada. You know, I tweeted an image this afternoon, or was it late morning, of a brother who gave me a big hug. And I didn't really know where it was, but later on I remembered. You know what happened? I was in a city known as Davao. Do you know where that is? It's in the Philippines, mashallah, beautiful place. And we had an open Q&A session, question and answer session. And one brother was enthusiastically putting up his hand to ask a question, you know. So a little while later, I said, yes, what is the question? And he got the microphone and said, I just want a big hug from you. So I got up and gave him a big hug, mashallah. And somebody captured that image and they sent it to me today. And I remember it was genuine. I don't know him. I can't recall his name. But I know that he shared with me the shahada. And he might have been going through whatever he was, or maybe he wasn't. But he just wanted that reassurance, the feeling of love between us. My brothers and sisters, it is there. With or without the hug. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us hug each other with good words at least. MashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So it was such a nice feeling. As I entered, I asked, how was the sound? And when I opened my mouth here and now, I was happy that mashallah, the masjid is definitely upgraded. I was here last year and it was not looking as posh as it is today. Mashallah, this is the house of Allah. We're so happy to be here this evening, my brothers and sisters. So think for a moment and I'm going to dive into the topic. When I say I love you or when you say I love you to someone. Firstly, who do you say it to and what do you mean? Think about it for a moment. I think a lot of us, when we think of I love you, it all depends on how you're saying it. If I say brothers and sisters, I love you for the sake of Allah. The tone of that shows you that the love is not I love you. You see, it's a different tone, right? So it would mean something slightly different, wouldn't it? It is because the rights that are to be fulfilled of those you utter those words to are great. When you say I love you to someone, you are reconfirming the rights that they have over you and the fact that you will fulfill them in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But let's face facts. Today when young people and sometimes even those who are slightly older, when they tell the opposite sex, I love you, a lot of the times it's connected to some feature that is external and physical. So you see someone looking very, very good, pretty or handsome or gorgeous or famous or someone of that nature. Oh, I love you, which means I love the way you look. I love your money. That's what it also means. But we just said, I love you. you. Your money is an extension of you. And this is why the infatuation of some of the people and the way they say, I love you, and they expect to be 
told I love you too. It's like a common, it's like Salaamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum as So I love you, I love you too. That's not the answer of I love you. Not necessarily. It depends who is saying it, when they are saying it, why they are saying it, how they are saying it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us genuine. May He make us sincere. Because I've seen many cases, even marriages, people claim that they love each other, but actually they don't. They end up marrying and they start fighting because we can no longer go out to eat every day. We can no longer be on a perpetual honeymoon. And we can no longer be people who, you know, live the life of the night every evening where we go out to the parties and so on. Love is not all about that. Love is about sacrifice. When you say I love you to someone, in essence, you are actually telling them I care for you to the degree that I will fulfill all your rights and I will look after you through thick and thin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us happy homes. And the reason why I start off with the love of the opposite sex is because generally when we say the fiqh of love and people see a big heart, you know, I always wonder why do they use the heart to depict love? Even on WhatsApp, have you noticed what they did now? If you put one heart, it becomes big and it starts pumping. <laughs> have you noticed that? Yes. It suddenly becomes big and it goes doof. Doof, doof. Have you seen that? Well, I have as well. And don't worry, I send it to the right people, mashallah. <laughs> so, it's because it's supposed to come from the heart. But nowadays it comes from the tongue. So I think they should show a tongue rather than a heart. They should just show a tongue, I love you, and go, you know. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Because we utter with our tongues what's not in our hearts. We say what we do not do. And we do the opposite of what we say. So I love you and five minutes later you see someone a little bit prettier. I love you now. <laughs> That's what it is. Or oh, a month later the money runs out and you say, well now I love the other guy. Why? Because he's taking me to a bigger party. Yes, you can no longer take me to the party. This is why those who really love one another, they stick with one another even through difficult days. They are a pillar of support. Look at those who married a long time back when they married for the right reasons. And this is why we need to take cue from the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he speaks about marriage. And he says, you marry the opposite sex for several reasons. Some marry for looks, some marry for wealth, some marry for lineage, some marry for various other issues, and some marry for the deen, for the religion, or for character and conduct combined with the religion known as a deen. So he says, the one who is most successful, or if you wish to be the most successful, you need to consider the last point as the most strong, the strongest of the lot. Which means I will look at what my spouse looks like. Yes, and if I'm comfortable with it, doesn't have to be drop dead gorgeous. Have you ever thought of that statement? Drop dead gorgeous. Have you heard it before? Yes, you have. Have you ever thought of why they say it? Because a little while later, when the gorgeousness goes, then you actually drop dead. <laughs> because we start developing wrinkles in no time. Have you seen that? People get married and a while later they get gray hairs. What happened, my brother? Stress. Not mistress, but just the stress. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Like I heard someone say the other day that you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. <laughs> really, you know, the mobile phone has taken over completely. It has enslaved us, honestly. So they say, when you see a missed call, you don't get worried. But when you see a missus call, then you get really worried. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So we need to learn from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu that we will have a peep at what your spouse looks like. Not even have a peep alone, but you need to be comfortable with what they look like. But that's not the only thing that you should be looking at. It's one of the things. But it's not the prime item. I tell you why. In a few years, looks change. People say, handsome. Come and see me 20 years down the line. You'll say, oh, may Allah forgive us. <laughs> we won't want to see. Take a look at your own photographs of a long time back. Anyone who's 50 plus, mashallah. 
few years ago, you, how were you looking? You might see the picture and say, handsome man. And you say, you or me? Okay, okay. You look at the mirror and you say, oh, I wish I looked like this. No, it changes with the changing of time. It actually changes. Whether you like it or not, you can be whoever, whoever. It changes. So we get to the hadith where he speaks of wealth. You marry for money. Guess what happens? It goes. And if it doesn't go, you go before it. Yes, it's a fact. Your wealth either goes or you go. One of the two. And when you go, the others fight over it. The more you leave, the bigger the fight. Because there is a larger amount at stake. So if you've left $500 when you died, no one's worried. Because they'll say, Khalas, take it, man. It's okay. It's okay. You must remember Allah says, Faridatam min Allah. Your portion you have to take. You cannot deny it. It's part of the injunction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you've left 500 million, guess what happens? Suddenly everyone is related to you. They become a relative. I've known of a case among the Muslims where they've gone into DNA testing in order to prove a point. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Just because there were millions left. The same people, if there was a small amount left, it wouldn't have been the case. So this is why Allah says, spend, spend in his cause. Don't be miserly, spend on your family, your children, spend on a good cause. Because whatever you've spent goes down next to your name, you spent it. Whatever you leave behind, someone else's name is written next to it. Do you know that? So you marry for wealth, you will be tested. You marry for looks, you will be tested. You marry because someone, you consider them lineage. Okay, this status, power, authority, this person is a mayor and they will only marry someone who comes from another mayor's family. Mayor, mashallah. May Allah grant us all goodness and may He make us fulfill our obligations as they are meant to be fulfilled. And I'm sure from amongst us, there are mayors who do a good job. May Allah make it easy for them. Allah can drop a person down in five seconds. You know that. How many have dropped? Allah protect us. FIFA. What happened to FIFA? You know, and the reason I say it is because it's fresh in the news. You know what happened? Suddenly there was a big letdown. And then I heard one of them say, well, the ball is round. It can be kicked anyway. I said, oh, you're trying to justify? We don't know whether allegations are true or not. That's a fact. But the reality is they've been made. And it's been a big letdown for a lot of people. So many companies have said, look, this is something that we were not expecting. And it's very bad for the image of football. Yet one hour prior to that, the same people had no clue that their faces were going to be splattered all over the, the media in a derogatory way. Did they? So from the seven star hotels, luxury home into a little prison in how many minutes? 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Life changed completely. Imagine the amount of distress. And if they are innocent, they probably will come out innocent. But look at the distress. Who did that? Well, sometimes their own doings and sometimes it's just a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test us in any way, in any way. But if you have based your choice of marriage on a person that you really look up to in terms of their character, their conduct, the way they are connected to Allah, the way they speak, their politeness, their sweetness, their, the manner that they interact with people, the way they care for the rest of humanity. These qualities can only get better as time passes. If a person is of good character, the chances of that good character being or becoming bad are minimized or they are made small as the person grows older. In fact, those who have been grown up or those who have grown up with bad habits and character, as they grow older, the chances of them coming towards goodness grow. So this is why we say, if you have this character, 
and conduct and dedication to the deen and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have looked at, you are the winner. The hadith says, Fadfar bidati deen, become victorious by marrying the one who has deen. And the meaning of deen is the one who has a link with Allah, the one who's developed their character and conduct. It's explained in another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he is speaking of the, to the awliya of the females. And he is saying, إِذَا أَتَاكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ If someone has proposed to marry your daughter and they happen to be a person who has exemplary or good character and conduct, if you are happy with their level of deen and character, then let them get married. If your daughter is happy with it, let it happen. If you don't, there will be great chaos on earth. This is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So we learn from this that love is based on something deeper than just the tongue. Something deeper than physical looks. Look. It's deeper than that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So what is the ultimate love? What is it that we are we grow up with? You know, one might talk about the love of our parents. It's a different type of love altogether. But let's pause for a moment and speak about what we mean when we say I love you to mom and dad. And what they mean when they say I love you. What parents mean when they say I love you to their children. And what they're supposed to be doing to prove that love. So I need to spend a moment because a lot of us are lost in this regard. You tell your child I love you. I love you so much. Oh my son, I love you. So now when the son does something wrong, I love you, I love you, don't worry, let's go to the mall. You want to buy candy? Let's, let's go buy it. You want a whole box of chocolates? It's yours. What else? You want to do this? You can do it. You, you want to buy food? Go buy it. You want to do this? Go and have it. Is that love? Let's be honest. Giving your child whatever the child wants, ooh, I love my dad. That's what it's become today. We cannot correct them and we cannot accept correction. That's what it is. I love my dad. Why? He buys everything for me. Look at that. Wallahi, these are statements made by kids. I love my mom. Oh, she's cool. She doesn't tell me anything. I can bring my friends over anytime and I can do whatever I want. You know, mom, she's so cool, man. Have you heard that? Oh, I love her. But the minute mom gets you up in the morning for Salatul Fajr, that is true love. Mom, don't you love me? You don't want me to sleep? This is a fact. This is why when we speak of the fiqh of love, you know, the essence of this love, what is supposed to be shown in our deeds, actions and words to prove this love. It's not that mom gets you up for Salatul Fajr or dad scolds you sometime or disciplines you by telling you to stand in the corner there or by telling you, listen, you've got to give me your iPad and we're going to take it away for one week because of what you said to your school teacher. If you were, for example, vulgar or you lied or you did something bad, part of the love of your mother and father for you is to discipline you as a child. Remember this. Then you say, I love you, mom. Thank you so much for correcting me. But sometimes you will only realize this when you grow old and have your own children and they will still think you don't love them. But now you realize your mom loved you. Your dad sacrificed for you. You love your child. Spend time with them. Spend time with them. A lot of it. Sit with the Quran with your child and open it up and make them read. Make them read, meaning teach them. Be patient with them. A lot of us are impatient. We say, I love you, my child. What love? You don't even have the time to spend with your children and you claiming you love them. Your love means something else. It means for as long as you don't mess, for as long as I don't need to teach you anything, for as long as I don't need to tell you anything, I love you, it's okay. It's a statement from my mouth. When your child does something wrong, how do you correct the child? That also will prove how much you love the child. You don't have to yell. You don't have to beat up your child in order to prove love. Not at all. You need to address the matter. Here in this country, a few days ago, we were faced with people or young men who were brainwashed online perhaps, and they decided to, to, you know, engage or do things that were not taught by Islam at all, thinking that it's Islam. One of the reasons is there's a vacuum somewhere which was being filled by someone online. That's what it is. And I'm quite sure that one of the solutions of that 
is to consolidate the relationship in the home between parents and children. You don't need to keep an eye and spy on your kids. But you need to have such a brilliant relationship that there won't be the need to spy because they will confide in you. They will get their knowledge from you. They will get guidance from you. They see you going to the masjid. They see who you connect with. They want to connect with similar people because they see the positive impact it has had in your life. The problem with us, we don't have a connection with the masjid. We don't go to the sharahan or the tadkira or the lectures, whatever you want to call it. We don't attend. We're not connected to any of the scholars. So when the children want to turn to Allah, they've got nowhere to go. You never take them to the house of Allah. You don't come and attend at all. You show no interest. You don't even read your own salah. So the child starts Googling. And when they start Googling, they're bowled out. Bowled out completely. Mid-wicked, out. Because they are getting knowledge from the unknown sources. And these extremists are using the internet wholesale. Trust me, they have departments where they concentrate on young people. They concentrate on the frustrations of the, of the young and the youth. And they give them soothing words. It's like some of the rapists. Do you know what they do? They prey on the unsuspecting by telling them they care and they love and so on. I love you. Oh, no one's ever told me that. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Wallahi, this is happening and it's happening online. I love you. In, it's like a password to your heart. That's what we say. I love you. <laughs> heart is open. Ooh. Now you can do what you want. The next thing, I want to meet you. Okay, let's meet for coffee. What? Who was that? Wallahi, if the parents have been saying I love you truly to that child and they've been taking a keen interest in the life of the child, spending time to go out and have clean fun with the child. No, th there is no benefit or it will not help you to say, listen, you know, to go here and go there is haram, so sit at home. To go here and to go there is haram. So to go to the other places, this place and the other place is halal. It's okay. We will go. We will have fun and we will have fun as a family and we're going to go on an outing. By the way, tomorrow's the holiday. You can practice. You can start, inshallah. Take your kids out, inshallah. Go somewhere. Spend the time with them, the day. Go picnicking. Dad, for once, inshallah, cook. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So you spend time with them. You've taken them. They've come out with you. They've seen you. You've played with them. You rode a boat with them. You went out to the sling with them. What's it called? Reverse Subhanallah, reverse bungee. Oh, have you heard that? It's here, they were showing me. They were trying to talk me into going there. <laughs> Trust me. I told them, no, that's child's play, child's play. We do skydiving, mashallah. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. This is clean fun. People wonder, why on earth did you go skydiving? Well, I'm talking about it today. And that's what I'm telling you. And you know, the alternatives for our children, what are they? It may not be something as uh, difficult as a skydive, but it will be something that will keep them occupied. They have something to talk about, you know, really. Because it's better than a nightclub and it's better than so many other things that they want to do that, that sometimes their friends pressurize them into doing. When you go to school on a Monday morning, the children go to school and what do they hear? Oh, I watched that movie. Did you see? Now they're 51 shades of grey. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> May Allah forgive us. They added one more shade. <laughs> Guess what that shade is? The last shade of grey is called black. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. It darkens you, darkens your heart completely. Chases away the noor. Chases away everything. So if you're not going to... In fact, when they hear these things, they start thinking, what's this all about? When they come home, you know nothing about it because you're living in the 60s, dad. That's what it is. You need to be alert. You need to know what's going on. You need to know it and you need to be able to talk about it. And you need to be able to tell your child, listen, you know what? That's not what we're supposed to be doing because... And then you start rattling out the reasons, proper reasons. And they hear how people went to the nightclub and they enjoyed themselves with drugs and alcohol. And the children hear about it. And when they hear about it, what do they think? You know, after some time, 
Some of the children might be trapped by shaitan because of peer pressure. And you need to know peer pressure is a reality. It can make a child suicidal. Do you know that? Some have already committed suicide because of peer pressure. And so we need to be alert. It's the love we're talking about. That love should make you cons be concerned enough to be able to take your child and to go on an outing, have fun. Climb the mountains, go mountain climbing, mashallah. Go biking, ride to Johor, mashallah. It's around the corner, I believe. <laughs> Subhanallah. Go somewhere, do something constructive. Occupy them with something permissible. Not necessarily something that is, you know, direct act of worship only. Something permissible, so you go and have fun. S time of salah, you make it very interesting to fulfill salah. Because you know, children nowadays, you tell them salah this one. And you tell them movie, they all day, mashallah. So you make salah as interesting as that and even more. By not delaying, don't read long prayers. You know, when I read with dad, you know, dad says he wants to read me a story from a good Islamic book. But when he sits to read, 45 minutes later, he's reading and we're all dozing. Read it for five minutes. You don't have to read it. You read it and just give a summary to your children. Or today we have DVDs, we have audio CDs, we have MP3s, we have the internet, we have YouTube. You select something very interesting and play it. Let it be short. This is the reason why I prefer for talks to be between 30 minutes to one hour, not more. 30 minutes is good, inshallah. 45 minutes, okay. How long do you want me to talk for today? <laughs> mashallah. Oh, someone says two hours. Is it, you said two hours? I don't think the women will agree. They've been here since Dhuhr. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us all. So my brothers and sisters, yes, something short, be considerate of them. When I see young children sitting in the talk, I feel for them to say, you know what, this child, these children are staying awake. Let me round up quickly, subhanallah. Or make it very interesting that they don't mind sitting. Every little while they're smiling and looking at you and laughing because they've caught the joke, haven't they? Mashallah. A moment, a light moment. But we can no longer, you know, deliver a sermon in a way that we're blasting the people for two hours. They will all look at you and feel the heat of Jahannam already. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. The times have changed, the message has not changed. So the method of delivery will need to change, but the content will not change. I will still call you towards salah, but we give you beautiful examples. Still call you towards wearing your hijab, but we give you beautiful examples. Why? It's the love, it's the care. We care for you. We understand the environment. We have to understand the environment. When you love your sisters, for example, for the sake of Allah and the brothers, you need to understand they're living in a situation that makes it difficult for them to abide by Islamic rulings. They need a lot of courage. They need a lot of good words. They need people who, who will encourage them in a sweet, beautiful way. And they need a pat on the back. They need to be able to be acknowledged the fact that they are trying. So many of us discourage our brothers and sisters without knowing that they've come a long, long way from where they were some time back. For you to be seated here in the house of Allah, it is my duty to acknowledge that you are a guest of Allah. That's what, the first thing. And you have come here to listen to a good speech. You did not come here to listen to politics. You did not come here for me to be name calling the rest of the Muslim Ummah. This guy is that, that guy is a deviant and this guy is like this. No, that's not what you are here for. You want to hear something uplifting, something that you can go back home, apply it in your lives and feel like a good Muslim. Am I right? Well, that's why I am here. I also want to feel like a good Muslim and I want to feel a part of your family. That's the fact. So you are the guests of Allah. Guess what? So am I. I need to respect you. I need to love you. I need to say words that are correct and upright. You don't want to hear things that are far off from what Allah has taught and his Rasul have taught. Agreed? So we will continue reminding what Allah has said. I was speaking about the parents and the children. Wallahi, it's a topic. It's a huge topic. The love. You love your child, you correct the child. But the manner in which to speak with your children. You know, many times, a typical scenario, mom and dad, or sometimes dad, or sometimes mom, sometimes both of them do not participate 
in the lives of their children for many years. They don't discuss topics. They are not. They are closed. You know, our fathers and our forefathers. Their generations were different. They did not used to speak. I've never heard my dad tell my mom I love you, but I know he probably loves her more than the love we understand when we say I love you to our own spouses. Hey, that doesn't mean I don't love my family. I do, I do, mashallah. But without uttering it, they knew it. And they, they did not wait for one another to say I love you. If they did say it, they may have said it behind closed doors. I wonder what their fathers did and their mothers did. Today, every day, if you do not send 20 text messages to your wife or husband, I love you, there will be a mini judgment day when you get back home. <laughs> End of times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, really. And we have internet, WhatsApp, free calling, free this, but still we don't use it. Send it. Send the roses. It doesn't cost you a thing. You can send a whole garden on WhatsApp. And guess what? It costed you nothing. The only thing that's missing is the smell. I think soon there'll be technology. I was reading about it. Wallahi, they, without a joke, I'm not joking, I'm serious. They are saying that very soon technology will get to the point where you will be able to send the smell through your mobile device. I see people saying, go and read about it. Sheikh Google will confirm. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, so it's very important for us to know that while technology has advanced and communication has been made so easy with people who are very far away from you, we sometimes forget those who are the nearest. Those who are the nearest. Like I said, our parents, we didn't hear them say that. But in our case, you have to. And you have to spend more time. And the sacrifice levels are less. You have to admit. You have to agree. A long time ago, they would sacrifice. I recall a case where people suffered marital turbulence. And they separated for a long time. And many years later, they got together. House on fire, problem solved, everything gone. Mashallah. But they sacrificed for about, I think, between five and ten years. We were very young, but I recall this. And mashallah, the problem resolved. Today, five to ten minutes, we get irritated, honestly. We cannot handle sleeping in the couch separately. I'm gone. You won't see me out of the gate, out of the door. We're out. May Allah forgive us, really. Love is tested at the time of sacrifice. When the person you claim to love is now going through the most difficult times of their lives, do you still stand by them? Do you still look at their tears and wipe them off and say, I love you? That is far more genuine. When they've been embarrassed, when they've been struggling with something, when they've lost their money, lost their job, do you still stand by them? And do you still say, I love you? Subhanallah. May Allah help us to sacrifice. Sacrifice for our own children. Like I say, I was giving you the example of how people don't play a role in the lives of their children. And then at the age of 18, your son comes and says, do you know, I want to marry this person. You say, no way. Not over my dead body. So at night you hear the son getting up for tahajjud. Oh Allah, take my father away. Because he needs to go. Such a simple matter. If you were really interested and played a role from the very beginning, you would have guided your child as to what to do and what not to do. And your child would have come to you not when it's too late. Your daughter comes to you and says, you know what? Astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. But an example that needs to be given is an unwanted pregnancy. Will your child come up to you to confess or to say, I need your help, dad. I need your help, mom. If that's the case, there is love between you. You need to get up and help them. If you don't, they will get help from somewhere else. You may lose them even as a Muslim. They made a mistake very bad. Is it happening? It's happening. In our communities? Yes, in our communities. How are they dealing with it? Well, go and find out. If that happens in your case, may Allah never make it 
happen to us. But if it does, and it may, and it can, you need to know how to deal with it. True love would make you stand up, rise to the occasion, embrace your child, say, I'm very, very let down by what you've done, but let's see how we can deal with this. Let's see how best we can deal with this. Go for help, seek some counseling, take your child here and there, ask for religious rulings, see what's the case, what has happened. And you don't need to scream and yell because that doesn't help. We need to be disciplined people. A few years ago, the advice would have been different. But today the world has changed. Like I said, the ruling remains the same. It's still wrong. It will not be right. But how to deal with the wrong in a way that it is not repeated. In a way that we do not lose the person as a Muslim. People have left Islam because their parents have not dealt with them in a correct way when they made mistakes. And here come the church and it provided shelter and help. Come, we'll give you help. So the people converted. Wallahi, I know of cases. Why should that be the case? When we have a perfect deen, the problem with us, sometimes we have contaminated it with cultural norms that happen to be far from the deen. And we've always said culture comes with a lot of goodness. But where it makes life difficult for people and where it contradicts Islam and what Allah has revealed, then we will say that culture is not good. Let me give you an example. Today I heard earlier on, and this is my fourth session for today. So, you know, I might be looking a bit tired, but I'm trying not to look tired. I'm pretending. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Earlier today, I heard that a lot of boys and men are not getting married in Singapore. They're delaying. Is that true? Oh, I heard a yes. It sounded quite feminine, mashallah. <laughs> the truth is, there must be a reason. There has to be a reason. Maybe it's too expensive. Maybe we have a culture that charges them too much. Maybe there is something wrong in society where it's un-Islamic. That's the problem. I'm not supporting the men, but I'm saying deal with your crisis. Stop selling the girls. Father says, I need 25,000. Hey, I'll have to work for 25 years because I save a thousand a year. So adultery happens for 25 years, three unwanted kids, no problem. I need my 25,000. Is that the attitude? I hope not, but it is in some countries. I'm not too sure about the culture here. I promise you, I don't know. I haven't asked anyone, but I'm just presuming that there has to be something. If I were to ask you and sit with you, I would get to the bottom of it. And I'm sure you know what the problem is. There is something wrong. We demand too much. We've become people who've made marriage difficult. So adultery becomes easy. Where is the love of Allah? Where is the true love for our daughters? When we are making life difficult for them, they want to marry. They have someone they want to marry. But no, he's going to revert. I'm embarrassed. If he's ready to revert, open the doors. I'll fly down to Singapore to get that nikah done if the need be. So what? He's a revert. He's probably cleaner than you and me. He's got a slate that is far fresher. The pages of his book are not even, the first one's not yet filled. And ours 20 pages of sins are already filled. And we say, revert, I'm not accepting. What love do you have for Allah? What love do you have for the Rasul? What love do you have for the Sunnah? What love do you have for Islam? What love do you have for your son? What love do you have for your daughter? That's not love. That is your pride and your own pride. What it does, it shows that when you say, I love you, it's just a hypocritical statement that means nothing. You don't love them. It's only an, a, a statement of convenience. You want to show off to people that in my family, everything's going to happen perfect. Whereas you are living in a very imperfect world. Perfection will only be in Jannah, not here. So if you are too embarrassed about the truth, it means you don't really love Allah and His Rasul, and you don't really love your family members. It's a fact. You need to get up. You cannot disown your child simply because they made a mistake. That's not love. You need to correct them. You need to stand by them. Allah blessed you with a child. The child came up and told you something that you did not like. The child has now, yes, 
caused some embarrassment. I do agree. It might be embarrassment, but that does not mean that you now need to deal with it in a way that will embarrass the entire ummah. You need to get up and deal with it in a beautiful way. You need to ask Allah's guidance, cry for the help of Allah and try and help facilitate, make it easy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. The next time I come here, inshallah, I want to hear that the bulk of the boys are married. I'm sure the girls want to marry as well. So the fathers, please, can you make it easy for everyone? And the mothers, please make it easy. Don't worry. Have a simple wedding. The most barakah, the most blessings are in those weddings that have the least amount of money used and cost. Have a simple wedding. Have a nikah in the masjid. And guess what? Distribute some plates of sweets and that's it. Mashallah. That was your walima, small one, where we just gave sweetmeats to everyone. It's not wrong. It doesn't mean you need to live up to the Joneses. In my part of the world, do you know what happens? People go to the bank to get a loan in order to prove that we have had a big wedding. They keep on paying back the loan. By that time, the marriage is broken and they are now having another marriage. The loan, is, the loan of the first marriage is still being paid. Imagine. And the loan is now taken from another bank because you're too embarrassed to go to the first bank and say, daughter needs to marry again. Allah forgive us. This is when we want to make a show. Don't make a show. Be real. The happiest of homes are those that are real, not those that are just a show. You get tired of the show after a while. Your husband cannot afford a BMW 7 Series, no problem. Inshallah. You drive a Toyota like mine, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. You might want to know what car I drive. It's called a Toyota Aorus. Have you come across it? An Aorus. Small little car, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. And I also have a little Valfire, alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah. <laughs> but it's still a Toyota, isn't it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and ease. And by the way, we get the leftovers from Singapore. Do you know that? They come to our countries and they're sold on our streets. I drove a Mark X for many years, which came from Singapore. Do you know that? You, one of you might have owned it. I don't even know. Perhaps that's why I'm smiling so much. But by the way, I sold it. Alhamdulillah. But my brothers and sisters, if you want your husband or your spouse or your, you know, your family member to have the posh vehicle and this and to live in the upmarket area before they marry, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. We use public transport. Alhamdulillah. I don't mind. Wallahi, I don't mind jumping into a little taxi or a bus. I really don't mind. If that's how it is, that's how it should be. No matter who you are, learn to understand the reality. It shouldn't be a show. It's not a show. We are not living in a movie where we are actors. Because go and ask the same actors in real life, they are struggling. Wallahi. They are struggling. Read about them. Like I told you, Sheikh Google knows a lot. Wallahi, he does. He will tell you so many things. Their love lives are upside down because of the glamour and the glitter. And that's it. They are changing boyfriends and girlfriends like they change underwear. Some of you might say that means they don't really change underwear. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us really. Upside down, lives are breaking. People prefer not to get married. Today in the Western world, you know what's happening? They prefer to just be a partner. This is my partner. Sometimes there are many partners. Astaghfirullah. I don't want commitment because we are no longer genuine. When we say I love you, you can't even make a commitment. That's what it is. So my brothers and sisters, now let's speak up to the children for a few minutes. Regarding your parents, if your father or mother never corrects you, they do not love you. Remember that. If they tell you, get up for Salatul Fajr, they have true love for you. If they correct the way you speak, if they correct the way you walk, they love you. If they correct the way you address people, your character, if they correct the way you eat, they love you. If they correct the way you pray, they love you. If they constantly tell you what's right and wrong, they love you. But if they buy everything and anything you want, they do not love you. They're just saying, I love you because they just want to keep you quiet. It's like the people who say, oh, my child makes a lot of noise. So what do you do? Well, I turn on the TV and put them in front of the television. And that's it. Quiet. Give them the iPad and tell them, play Angry Birds. So all my birds are angry. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I've always wanted to ask someone to create a game called Happy Birds. Really, it will make my day. Happy Birds. It's not good enough to, to be happy at the silence of your child. No. Oh, my child is quiet. So well behaved. They're not well behaved. They are being indoctrinated even through games. A lot of the games preach violence. And I'm saying preaching because it, it's become a religion. Do you know that? And these games are made by the same people who call us terrorists. Really, they make these games where you get points to kill people. That is terrorism. They are training little children to become terrorists. And they're telling us, I would never allow my child to play such a game. Never. No matter how popular it is. And when I say never allow, I, I won't just tell them this is not allowed. I sit them down and explain to them why and the harms of it. And look at this. And this is why I believe that such games should be banned across the globe. Because they really are unacceptable. People say, it's just a game, just a game. Go and see the amount of shootings happening in the United States of America, in the schools. Little children going to shoot their teachers because the teacher didn't give them 100%. The colleges and so many other places, people disagree with each other. The gun is out, next thing, shoot, shoot, shoot. So many bikers dead. It's a fact. The most murders on earth are committed in those countries that have made the whole country play these games and it's considered the in thing what love do they have for the nation nothing we need to love our nations enough to be able to contribute positively to a nation not negatively what have you done have you invented something have you been a part of the renovation of this masjid have you contributed in some way to your community to your nation that is love of the nation. That is love of the masjid. That is love of the community. Love of the ummah. Love of humanity at large. The concern when you see the enemies of Islam, those who detest Islam, what have you done to try and bring them closer to Islam? You need to love the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, love is of different levels. I don't expect you to love a mu'min and ghayrul mu'min the same. But what we do need to know is we, they all have rights. Like I said at the beginning, love, true love would be a commitment to fulfill the rights of those whom you've uttered the words to. Fulfill your rights. Brother, the person is a human being. My brother, my sister, my father, my mother. If these people are not Muslim, what is my duty towards them? They are not Muslim. Do I just take a gun and shoot all of them and say, right, that's what we've been taught by ISIS? Astaghfirullah, that's not Islam. Not at all. Islam is to treat them so well. The Quran says, the non-Muslim parents of yours, go out, sacrifice for them, fulfill the duties towards them, serve them. The only thing is if they try and bring you back to the old faith of theirs, that you don't go. If they try to make you do things that are in the displeasure of Allah, you don't do. But even though they are trying, you still continue to fulfill their rights and be kind to them and good. Wa inja hadaka. Look at the love between parents and children. Allah says, if they are struggling and striving, the term used is jahadaka. If they work hard on you to associate partners with Allah, to remove you from Islam, to take you back to the old faith, then don't follow that much. But, the verse continues to say, you will still continue to fulfill their rights. Live with them in a good way, peaceful way, serving them still in this life. Imagine non-Muslim parents. Because the concern we are supposed to be having for the non-Muslim is such that we should want to see them come to this goodness. But when we live our lives in such a way that they cannot see any goodness in our lives, how do we expect them to come to the goodness? May Allah help us. So my brothers and sisters, the little children that we were speaking to a few moments ago, let us concentrate on them. Let us help them 
What is the point of sending them to top schools when we haven't yet taught them Alif and Ba? We haven't yet taught them how to read Salah. They've never witnessed us pick up the Quran. What would they do? A day will come when they might meet someone by the help of Allah who might guide them towards the goodness. But who knows, after a little while, they might be misguided by people who are waiting like vultures in order to prey on these children. So play a role. It's your duty. Wallahi, it's your duty. If you know what's going on, you would realize that it's your duty as parents to care for your children, to spend time with them, to smile at them, to look at them, to tell them you love them. Even when you're disciplining them, repeat, I love you so many times while taking away the iPad. I love you so much. I wouldn't want to do this. I really, I've done it with my own children. And I'm telling you, it's not easy to see your child cry for the iPad. But you say, you know, I don't want to do this. But I have to discipline you. I have to make sure this doesn't happen. You have to. This is a punishment that's set. I have to take this iPad away. Trust me, it is more painful than any beating that that child would have got in the previous generations. When I was young, I wouldn't have minded a beating, walloping. I wouldn't have minded it. But today they mind in a bigger way when you take away a gadget of theirs, a toy of theirs. That's it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. In fact, there is a certain age after which you give a child some form of gadget, before which you do not give them these electronic gadgets. It stunts their growth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. So these are just some of the pointers regarding parents and children. But let's get to society, community. We love each other for the sake of Allah. That's what we said, right? Are we considerate of one another? We come to the masjid, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today is boiling, it's hot. Do you agree? And subhanallah, it's humid. The fan cannot face everyone. Not everyone can be under the fan. MashaAllah, we've got a huge fan. The first time... <laughs> The first time I saw these fans was here in Singapore and mashallah I was so impressed and I seen such a big fan I think if this was a helicopter would have taken off <laughs> But my brothers and sisters it may not reach everyone you need to be people who care for one another one of the beautiful teachings of Islam is that when you're smelling offensive don't come to the masjid until you deal with the smell. Did you know that? If you've eaten fresh onions, go and wash your mouth thoroughly before you come to the masjid. You will offend people. These are your brothers in Islam. You are going to say, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim with your mouth open and someone else is saying, they're putting their fingers on their noses and you are saying, oh Allah, guide me to the straight path. And he's saying, next time, guide yourself not to eat the onions. <laughs> it's a fact. It happens. Perspiration, we perspire. Use some underarm if you have a problem of perspiration that is offensive in smell. Understand, it's part of your duty. This is what love is all about, to be considerate of the other. You love them, well, when you are selling something, don't just put a price that is mad. Be considerate, say, you know what, these are human beings. I'll make my profit and inshallah they'll be happy with the commodity. That's love. But to rip them off completely and say, oh, I made my money. And you go away. They'll all look at you and say, that's the crook. Even though you're driving your Benz, no problem. They don't like you. The reason is you had no feeling for them. Where's the love? This is why we need to be charitable. Charitable, give, learn to give. And giving is not only money, your time, effort, energy. Your expertise sometimes. You're a doctor. Well, go and volunteer somewhere for a short period of time. See what happens. That's the love you have for humanity at large. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us. So in a nutshell, in this whole hour, do you know one hour is gone? 58 minutes, 59 minutes on the dot. I hope I've spoke. Imagine there's so much of love we didn't even feel the time, right? That's the fiqh of love, mashallah, alhamdulillah. I hope I've spoken about a few pointers of love. And the main thing is, we need to be genuine. We need to sacrifice. We need to be able to understand the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
don't just utter the words I love you to people without meaning it. You love for the sake of Allah, alhamdulillah. Yes, and you can love someone even for your own sake. Alhamdulillah, in the sense, it's your spouse. They give you comfort. But remember that love is always governed by the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the person you love the most tells you to do something against the instruction of Allah, that's where it stops. Whether it is a spouse or anyone else. A child, a parent, whoever it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. My brothers and sisters, I really want to go on. But guess what? I have the worst news ever. I have a flight to catch. <laughs> Subhanallah. May Allah make it easy for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you in this beautiful country of Singapore. May He protect you from extremism. May He protect you from instability. And may He grant you such goodness that the nation flourishes in a way that even the non-Muslims realize that Islam is a religion of peace. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you the love in your homes, the love in your communities, in your masajid, the love everywhere else. And may Allah protect us from falling in love with the devil. Amen. Because when we say everything is all about love, with the devil it's all about hate. We detest the devil. We don't like the devil. We are supposed to be disliking the devil. No love between us and the devil. But sometimes the devil loves us because when he massages us early morning, we find that, or he finds that that massage has been successful. He, he makes us sleep. When he keeps on telling us, you know, if you are to show yourself as a Muslim, you are going to be embarrassed. People are not going to look at you in a good way. So we are embarrassed to even appear as Muslimin. Let that not happen. Be proud of your identity for indeed that is what will take you to Jannah. One day when you die and you come face to face with the Prophet, peace be upon him, he will recognize you as being from the Ummah if you were really from amongst those who were recognizable as being from his Ummah in this world. So that is why make yourself recognizable as a member of the Ummah, even if it's through your proper name to start with. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us develop over time. Sometimes people cannot change overnight. Some people can. But at least make an effort. Try, look into yourself and say, you know what? I'm sure I can. They all can. Mashallah. They all can. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. I recall, you know, a beautiful conversation I had with someone in Singapore. The last time I came. There was a gentleman, I'm not too sure, uh, he perhaps didn't know English very well or he might have uh, spoken Malay or something else and I wanted to do something. So I looked at him and because I knew he couldn't speak properly, I said, can? He said, can? <laughs> that was a whole discussion. <laughs> that was a complete discussion. I smiled at him, I almost wanted to give him a hug. Because I just told him, can. He said, can, which means, can I do this? And he said, yes, obviously you can. Come on, with all pleasure. I heard all these words in one can. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May he grant you all goodness and ease. Until we meet again in this beautiful masjid, mashallah. What a lovely crowd of people. I don't feel like going. You can see that, can't you? I already told you an hour's up. One hour, three minutes, 27 seconds. Whoa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all.